running through the various iterations of interaction orders, constitutive orders, constitutive background expectan expectancies, working consensus, and trust conditions is the idea that constitutive order is based on an underlying agreement between participants that constitutes the meaning of their actions. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was the first to argue in the origins of inequality that the state of being we call human and the moral issues associated with that state of being only come into existence at the point of social contract. Durkheim considered Rousseau to be a sociologist on this score and built his approach to sociology on the premise that both human reason and morality are the result of social order. Marx did so as well, which was the basis of his critique of economics. This being the case, human reason and morality also constitute the purpose of social order, giving both social order and religion their raison d'etre, a moral purpose in Durkheim's view, but one which is grossly distorted by inequality. However, while Marx and Durkheim both make direct references to this argument, erroneously citing Rousseau's social contract as the source, and Max Weber, Economy and Society, pages 8 to 20, and George Herbert Mead, make use of the idea of a reciprocity of position based on a consensus of some sort in explaining shared meaning and self-reflection. The idea of an agreement remains undeveloped in their work. When it does appear, the emphasis tends to be on institutions and shared beliefs, on institutional constraint rather than mutual agreement. Sato, who treated the idea of social contract as central to social order, treated it as an ultimate achievement, not as a foundation. In spite of the insight regarding the constitutive relationship between an agreement and the constitution of human reason and morality, social objects and selves were still often treated by classical theorists as natural objects in ways that take for granted aspects of the same individualism that they criticized. With the publication of Goffman's presentation of self and Garfinkel's argument with regard to trust conditions and articulation of an actual social agreement, a working consensus was offered for the first time as the constitutive basis for the coherence of everyday social objects and selves. Garfinkel's trust argument, which significantly broadened the scope of the agreement as Goffman drew it, was published within a few years in 1963. Both offer the working agreement as an actual necessity and not as a hypothetical or idea such as Habermas's conditions for communicative action. The argument that the agreement is necessary, necessary rests on Goffman's particular conception of the self and Garfinkel's conception of mutual intelligibility as a constitutive matter of interaction. Therefore, it is important to understand just exactly what qualities of self and mutual intelligibility make the agreement necessary. Making any changes to the self or interaction, communication, that would give them more resilience are built in stability over time, or make them depend less on interaction will render the working agreement optional. Treating the stable features of interaction order as if they were social institutions has the same effect. Garfinkel's argument is stronger in this regard. 
making it clear that all social identities and objects are at risk. Mutual intelligibility, in his view, is almost entirely constituted through sequential orders of action oriented toward trust conditions, which are very like Goffman's working consensus. It has become popular to argue that, since independent individuals obviously exist as bodies with consciousness, there must be a core self that is resilient, and this has been one of the difficulties. This is especially the case since Goffman resisted the stronger version of the argument that the meaning of social objects and language are also at risk in interaction that was made by Garfinkel and Sachs. If selves and social objects can exist independently of constitutive interaction orders, then a constitutive agreement is not required for either self or sense making. The working consensus in that case would not be required. Individuals could be posited as possessing core identities which persist naturally over time and as somehow having access to reason or language as a body of concepts that can be assembled in various logical ways to convey meaning to others. This is the conventional view. It was the project of Garfinkel and Goffman to challenge this view. Their approach treats the self as almost entirely dependent on constitutive action for its existence. This gives the working consensus a force and a self-correcting self character that is missing in earlier sociological treatments of self. Both the self and its capacity to communicate are very fragile matters. It is this fragility that explains everything and on which the constitutive interaction order argument needs to be built. Only if self and meaning must be constituted in him and through interaction will something be required that could make this birthing, maintaining and dying of selves possible. Some consistency in the way sounds and gestures are orchestrated that makes them recognizable as moves of a particular sort to other participants will be a fundamental requirement. Such a recognizability of moves in turn requires an agreement. This makes the empirical research by conversation analysis and ethnomethodology essential to the theoretical argument. Only if the argument can be established empirically does it hold. It is only because all interaction involves risk and what is at risk is of enormous con consequence that the agreement holds. There is a risk that others will not ratify the self, a risk that one's view of things will be at fault and damage others the situation or oneself, a risk that something that one does will damage someone else, a risk that the essential sociality on which everything else, including individual self-interest, depends could be damaged by actions that destroy the mutual understanding of the particular constitutive order we happen to be involved in at the moment, and so on. It is essential to the argument to establish that constitutive practices whose ordered details are constitutive of their meaning work only in so far as some working agreement about how particulars can be constituted using such practices is actually maintained. The agreement cannot be hypothetical or work merely as a guide. The agreement must be actual and not only committed by all participants, but constant displays of that commitment and the ongoing interpretations of sequences must also be performed. The displays of the agreement must be adequate to the details the participants will need to manage. The agreement also needs to provide for how 
the parties how the practices can be extended and amended. Garfinkel's much misunderstood elaboration of the etc. clause, ad hocking, instruction, and praxeological validity handles these issues by distinguishing rules from working expectations about their application. In theory, the constitutive interaction order is something like a game with rules, but with unspecified and incomplete rules, incomplete information, and not one but many games that can change rapidly. This social arena is inhabited by acting selves whose identities orient the game in question and whose ability to make sense of the practice of the moment is made possible only by their orientation to multiple layers of practice, background expectations and a moral agreement between participants. The analogy would be to many games that follow one after the other, moment by moment, the job of participants being to constantly display the game they are in and their commitment to it, to follow the displays of others as they make moves and or change games, and to display their own interpretations of those moves in order to both keep track of practices and game changes moving forward and also to achieve a public display of this reciprocal work that is avail available to all parties. Thus, as a practical matter, there is no need to deal with concepts in heads. The picture that results is of interaction in public as a challenging and satisfying mutual test of skill, but one in which everything required for mutual intelligibility is on the table at all times by mutual agreement. The back and forth mutually confirming character of interaction that results is a solution to the problem of interpretation. What is being proposed is that social life is something like a collection of many games with rules, a collection of many constitutive orders of practice. Some constitutive orders belong to specified places, others can be enacted anywhere. Some are conducted within an overarching context of institutional rules, norms, and values to which their results are accountable, but which do not constitute them. Others are entirely self-organizing. Social life is only something like a collection of many games, because the game analogy is too simple to capture what is going on in ordinary constitutive interaction for a number of reasons. One, rules cannot prescribe how they are to be followed, so they cannot explain the resulting order properties of constitutive interaction order. Two, selves or actors in ordinary constitutive interaction never have perfect information or perfect reason, and therefore mutual understanding always depends on a level of interpretation. And three, since the rational and socially identified character of selves are acquired over the course of play and consist of skills related to that play, reason and logic cannot be used independently to explain the play as they are in game theory. In speaking, participants will sometimes tell stories, they will sometimes issue invitations or ask questions. These turn types each have characteristic markers and impose obligations that are particular to them, although all are responsive to the working consensus, but they also have a relative position in an ongoing sequence that will have significance for the work that must be done to make the transition from one constitutive order to another recognizable to other participants. In building sequential meaning, position can override type criteria. Identity issues 
can override as well. Therefore, while there are some characteristic markers and sequence forms that can be associated with each of these turn types, the criteria for their recognition cannot be pre-specified. Participants need to build from one type to the next, working with sequence, sensitivities, identity issues, and maintaining and displaying mutual attention and reciprocity, and doing so while at all times maintaining the working consensus. These considerations, none of which can be pre-specified, are definitional of what any particular act of speech, turn at talk, can be seen to have been doing. Conversation analysis has documented order of preference which orient the practices for handling such changes and any troubles that come up in talk. Moves or turns are also oriented toward these orders of preference which hold across forms of talk. Kaufman's working consensus could similarly be described as consisting of a number of preferences. The benefit of the doubt preference elaborated by Goffman being another expression of a do-no-harm obligation implied by the working consensus. The preference orders that emerge from conversational analysis give detail to this obligation. Although Goffman himself did not fully appreciate this point and criticized Sachs and Shegloff in forms of talk for employing a kind of formalist empiricism that did not really characterize their work. Sachs, in particular, had spent a great deal of time with Garfinkel and was more seriously oriented toward documenting empirical details than Goffman, whose method has been characterized as literary. But as students of Goffman, both Sachs and Shegloff were oriented toward interaction order issues in elaborating their ideas about the turn-taking system in conversation. The preferences for self-correction, mitigated disagreement, and positive assessments that are specified in the turn-taking paper by Sachs et al. 1974 by Aren Terasaki in her work on pre turns 1984 and by Anita Pomerantz in her work on assessments, PhD dissertation 1984, are all consistent with Goffman's initial elaboration of a benefit of the doubt obligation. Reciprocity of position is another condition of the agreement, a version of do unto others with an added proviso that one should display to others one's interpretation of what the other has done. It does not, or at least it should not, support inequalities. Goffman worried a great deal because he knew that it sometimes did. One problem is the degree to which institutional orders impinge on interaction orders to produce such inequalities. This is something Goffman explored repeatedly, because reciprocity is a requirement of constitutive order. There should be a limit to the amount of inequality that interaction will tolerate, and this should create difficulties in institutional settings in which inequality is extreme. Goffman's first publication on the social functions of embarrassment, 1956, explored this problem. Many of Goffman's subsequent works, asylums in particular, continued to explore the limiting conditions of reciprocity on institutional orders, just how far inequality, whether imposed by social institutions or individuals, can go before interaction and selves break down. He found that there are always limits imposed on an institution by the fragility of self and argue that an orientation toward preserving the social objects that people claim to be and avoiding damage 
to both persons, and the situation is the requirement that explains those limitations. Garfinkel's trust conditions extend the idea of an agreement to specifiable sequential procedures that confirm and display reciprocity, while at the same time constituting the recognizability of social objects and meanings. This idea was first elaborated by Garfinkel in the 1948 manuscript and then in the trust paper. The trust requirement makes it clearer what the required reciprocity consists of. All participants in a situation must assume that the others are working with the same set of expe expectations that they are and that they are competent to enact them. They must also assume that the others assume the same things of them. They must also display this orientation with each next move. This agreement cannot just stand as an assumption. Both competence and commitment must be continually displayed or self and sense-making fail. At each and every next term, the mutual orientation toward the joint commitment must be displayed, must be made public. Grice, 1974, had argued that it is not possible to clarify talk through interpretation because that would involve an infinite regress, but Garfinkel shows how it is possible. Conversation analysis has further documented that the interaction order of talk provides for interpretation to be efficiently displayed term by term without engaging in any such infinite regress. Participants are required to make constant displays to one another, furthermore not knowing which position they will stand in next, re next requires all participants to protect all positions, thus maintaining a constant potential reciprocity of position is a limiting condition of the working consensus. Talk can be clear without this reciprocal work, but then, as Sachs points out, there will be fewer resources when problems arise and because mutual intelligibility is less at risk, the working consensus would be in doubt. Sachs argued that to the extent that talk can be rendered indexical and put at risk in the same way that the self is at risk in interaction, the resulting risk will bind communicants to reciprocity and benefit of the doubt conditions, listening and hearing obligations in such terms. More forcefully, if only self is at risk, people can still make sense without fulfilling involvement obligations. But if all sense making is at risk, then damage to either selves or the other properties of turns and sequences will damage all the sociality they have together. It has been my suggestion that the reciprocal commitments involved in the working consensus are an existing and working template for equality, fair distribution and justice, a golden rule in action on which we could profitably build. This is how I have interpreted two games recommendation that constitutive and spontaneous self-regulating practices in modern societies could, because they require justice, become an adequate and satisfying form of social solidarity that does not rest on institutional constraint. As societies have changed and social institutions and their shared norms and values no longer form the basis for social solidarity, a new form of social order based on justice and a fair distribution of opportunities within occupational practices will need to take its place. If it does not, mutual intelligibility and social personhood will fail. This interpretation is consistent with misunderstood argument of the division of labor. The way we talk 
how much indexicality we produce, the extent to which we rest meaning on grammar and syntax, or effect the degree to which meaning is fragile, and thus the moral tone of interaction and the degree to which the working consensus is a requirement. When reciprocity is achieved and all essential goods, persons, and intelligibility are at risk, the required working agreement has serious ethical overtones. Moral, in this case, does not mean normative. It means something more like justice or Kant's categorical imperative, the principles of which will equally distribute across all persons and all the interaction order forms that are at risk in this way. Kant's logical argument for non-contradiction of practice holds. The moral order of interaction orders supports ends of absolute moral value, human reason and mutual intelligibility. One cannot conceive of violating them without realizing that the violation contradicts the practice on which one is depending. By contrast, because social institutions are static and arbitrary, and the sense of actions within them, even when they are just, is not at risk in the same way, any morality in social institutions would be strictly contingent and normative. The agreement required by a constitutive interaction order is reminiscent of Kant's kingdom of ends, and as such is a domain of both equal opportunity and total necessity. The characteristic of protecting all positions also involves something like a veil of ignorance. Within a constitutive order, persons must assume that all positions could in the near future be their own, and therefore they must treat all positions with the same care and respect in order to preserve their own self-interest.